Yo, yo, yo. Hey guys, welcome back to another awesome edition of the Best Practices Show podcast. You ever thought to yourself, maybe I need a clinical coach? Well, today we talk about why you should have a clinical coach with two of my favorite, Dr. John Cranham and Dr. Noemi Cruz Orcutt. And today we talk about the difference between a mentor, a coach, and a teacher. It is powerful. So please listen up. I know you'll enjoy it, and we'll see you soon. Welcome back to the Best Practices Show podcast. You know the jam here. I like to find the greatest stories, greatest speakers, greatest coaches, greatest thinkers in all of dentistry, and we're going to open it up today. And our job is to pass along some good thought processes to you to help you create a better practice and better life. We're going to be talking about members, you know, mentorship and coaching and why it's so important to the development of all of us, not just dentists, but human beings in general with my good friend and one of my coaches, Dr. John Cranham, and Noemi Cruz Orcutt. Did I say that right? I hope I did. So um, we're meeting for the first time. And you were a student. Now you're going to become a coach, which we're going to learn about here in a second. So uh, I always love, you know, we have we have uh, so many young listeners. we got a lot of dental students listening now. I'd love for you guys to tell a little bit of your stories. And then we'll put together the topic. Who wants to go first? Go ahead, Noemi. All right. So my story, uh, I went to the University of Iowa for dental school. And uh, I'm originally from Puerto Rico. So that's where I did my undergrad. Then after um, completing dental school, I did an ABD at VCU, Virginia. And that's one thing John and I have in common going to VCU. Then after uh, practicing for about four years as an associate, I purchased um, my current practice back in Iowa. And I have been, it's gonna be eight years that I have been practicing um, here in Mason City, Iowa. So right now I am a solo practitioner. The, I also went to the Dawson Academy, graduated in 2019. And from there I have been taking numerous continuing education and uh, uh, I feel like it doesn't stop. And um, John has been one of my mentors in the process. Love it, love it. John, let's hear your story. Who yeah, are you? so I've been at it a really long time, uh, 34 <laughs> years uh, in dentistry now. And, um, you know, had my beginning with Pete Dawson right out of dental school, went through the Dawson Academy and back then, there was no hands-on at Dawson. So you did Dawson and then you went to the Panky Institute and did all the Panky. And then back before John Coyce and Frank Spear divorced, I went through their hands-on continuum when they were together. And so just like Noemi, uh, it's been a um, kind of a career of learning. Uh, I think what kind of got me on the map back in 95 as an educator is I was simultaneously taking Dawson Panky and a lot of, of the cosmetic courses, you know, involved with the ACD. And back then it was, you know, Rosenthal and, and Dickerson and Hornbrook and all those guys. Um, and what was interesting in the 90s is there was definitely a the idea of occlusion and cosmetic dentistry was kind of diametrically opposed. And and I started to I created a lecture that blended those things called the cosmetic occlusal connection, which which sort of got me going. Uh, I think what's interesting now is uh, after being with the Dawson Academy as the clinical director from about 2006 to 2020, I stepped down in 2019 and, and um, have been really focused on digital workflows. Mm -hmm. Noemi was actually one of my first, actually the first client that I worked with mm -hmm. uh, integrating the, uh, the digital workflows into her practice. But you know, here again, I think we're kind of doing it again a little bit in that, 
you know, digital dentistry used to be sort of one tooth dentistry. It wasn't always associated with comprehensive care. And what we're really trying to do, you know, in my uh, in my new venture is blend comprehensive care thinking, complete dentistry with 100% digital workflows and um, and training doctors to do that through video education online and online lectures and some in-person learning and then also one-on-one coaching, which is kind of what we wanted to talk about today because I do think it's one of those things in dentistry that is way underutilized. And with the technology today, like virtual articulation and the ability to treatment plan on a computer, we can use technologies like uh, or software like uh, TeamViewer or Zoom or any of these things to be able to to share a screen and and it's like you're sitting right next to one another. And I think it can really help um, connect dentists, whether you're a mentor type learning or a coach or or even an interdisciplinary team, maybe better than we've ever seen it before. Yeah. Totally agree. I'll tell a little bit of my story and then we'll kind of put put us all together here. But 2005, you did create that lecture. And that was one of the most controversial titles of any lecture in dentistry, the cosmetic occlusal connection. Like you might as well just be inviting conflict by doing that. And I flew up to Traverse City, Michigan, because I'd heard so much about you. And um, you know, long story short, you became an incredible mentor for me, not only just on the clinical side, but you helped me understand how a great restorative dentist thinks. And that was so powerful. What I didn't know is you were on the same journey as me as the Ironman. Mm -hmm. Now, John's a really good athlete. I am not. So I could drown in a pond that big for that long type of a thing. So I needed much as much assistance as possible. So in my time, you know, learning from you, learning from Pete, having another coach, even getting an Ironman coach, I learned that, you know, I'm a big Brene Brown fan. It's like, one of the things she says so well is we weren't designed to do any of this alone. We just weren't. And so when you start to get over that hurdle of, I can do this on my own, and you start looking for people that have been there, it speeds up the journey. It reduces your frustration. You actually experience joy at a higher level. You know, and so I want to know how you guys, well, first of all, John, you could speak to that. And then I want to hear about how you guys got together. And I know a lot of dentists listening to this are like, I don't know if I need a coach. I don't even know if I need a mentor. Like, what do I do? John, take us through that. Well, I can tell you, I mean, I, you know, one of the things that, and I was very fortunate, you know, early in my career, and a lot of people don't know this, but I, when I heard Dawson for the first and second time, I was you know, broke, broker than broke. And, and so there were some things that happened where, where a lab tech had told Pete a little bit about me and unbeknownst to me, Pete was, was creating a, a small study group uh, where we would all get on the same software. And it was just a front desk type management software called perfect bite B Y T E that something he created, which was kind of cute. Uh, and there were 20 of us and, and there were 19 really seasoned Dawson doctors that were all, you know, probably 40 to 50, 40 to 65. They're all older. And he wanted one young dentist. And that was my break. I mean, he, he approached me at seminar three and walked right up to me and said, you know, I'd like you to be in this group. Would you do it? You'd have to buy the software and it was expensive. And he said, but, you know, we'll meet four times a year. And I mean, and I didn't really have, the, I, was, I was probably in practice about a year when that happened. I'd been through two of his lectures. I was at the third when he invited me. And, you know, what you don't really realize is when, you ha- when you're that young and then you have the ear of maybe one of the best dentists that's ever been, and, and he got really close with him early. And then, of course, I ended up being partners with him, which is just another mind-blowing thing. But... But those first five years, I was in a meeting once a quarter with him and then 19 seasoned doctors. And we're all looking at numbers and we're all talking about things. And and I just totally, I mean, that probably jump-started my career 20 years. I mean, because I just learned things to do, but I also listened and learned a lot of things that I wasn't going to do. I was learning from the mistakes that some of them had made. Um, you know, just some of these best practice things. And, and that's what you really learn, you know, and you, you, 
did he mentioned about the Ironman? You know, I, I was a decent swimmer, but I wasn't much of a runner, and I certainly hadn't ever really ridden a bike much. So I, you know, I found Jerry Frostick, who was a coach that that had trained like seventy eight people to finish an Ironman, and you know, and 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 so it's, you know, it's it's a formula, right? I mean, he had a formula of what to do on what day and what to eat and what to eat and drink during the race, and you just had to do it. Now you still had to do it. You still have to do those things. So there's <laughs> discipline attached with that. Um, and we'll talk about that side of it. But if you have if you have somebody in your ear that you trust and you know if you put in the time that you're going to get a result, that's way different than putting time in when you're not sure you're going to get a result. That's called reinventing the wheel. And and you know, if I hadn't had that, those people, Pete and all those people early in my career, there's no way my career would have gone where it ended up. Because by the time I'd been practicing in 10 years, I probably had the experience and knowledge of a dentist doing it 30 years. And so you can get to a level much faster. You hear the, you hear the, the old adage, you know, standing on the shoulders of the people before. I mean, that's, that's what you're basically doing. You're just eliminating the trial and error process, eliminating mistakes and being able to drive right into workflows that work. And, and so, you know, we'll talk about how Noemi and I got going, but, you know, I, she has a very good business mind for that. And a lot of things she does both physically and in practice, but, you know, watching her extremely disciplined person but I think part of the reason she's disciplined is in, in watching her think she's very, uh, wants to get very clear on what it is she needs to be doing. And then she just does that. And there's just, she doesn't waver from that and then learns from it and gets a little better. And you know, I'm watching her now kind of evolve kind of with me now, and maybe even past me in certain areas and listening to different people at the ACD and all these different things and really refining her vision in the practice, but also utilizing all our digital workflows to do that, which is really, really cool. Yeah. No, Amy, tell us your story. What was the motivation or kind of the catalyst for you to say, Hey, listen, I need some coaching. Talk, talk about, talk about the COVID time. That's really kind of. Yeah. Funny. So, you know, interesting because um, like I mentioned, I have been taking and multiple continuing education after um, finishing school. And I knew I had a vision of how I wanted to practice. And there were a lot of uh, people I look, for, look, look up to in terms of that's the type of practice I would like, or this is the philosophy I want to implement for my patients. I wanted to be able to provide the best care and at the same time, treating more complex cases. And then during that process, you know, while I was going through us, and like John mentioned earlier, the fire happened right after my the previous owners of the practice had just retired six months prior to that. So I'm getting used to being a solo practitioner. And then um, New Year's Eve 2018, I get that um, uh, call of the fire. And I go back to that because I think that was a turning point for me how I was going to move forward because at that time it was either I'm going to have to work hard to rebuild and reestablish myself or am I done and uh, for me it was no question it was just we're moving forward and taking that time as an opportunity just, to and just yeah just clarify her office on that New Year's Eve burnt to the ground a beautiful office burnt wow. to the ground so so keep going so, I just want to make sure they knew that so, so it gave me a um, lot of perspective at that time. You know, uh, I re we were having a party at our house and I get the call 10 minutes before people were arriving. So here I am in the parking lot of the office by myself thinking about everything that's coming. And it was a turning point for me in terms of I became stronger. Like at that point, I'm like, this is an opportunity to have the type of practice I want and uh, we are going to get there. And I continued, I was still taking Dawson classes at that time, I hadn't finished the curriculum. But during that time, I kept sharpening the 
how are we going to do this and continue to implement when we open back up? So we open back up, then COVID, um, uh, we actually, I actually graduated Dawson while we were still rebuilding. And then uh, I be, the week before we, re, we moved back, I took my whole team to the implementation course at Dawson in St. Petersburg. I'm like, we are opening next week and this is how we, I want to make sure we practice this way. You know? <laughs> then we had um, COVID and we had to close again. And at that time, uh, everyone was used to it. We're like, well, we have done it before. We'll do it again. But I again committed that that was an opportunity that we were going to come back stronger because we were going to come back. There was no question. So during that time, uh, John, as a clinical director of the Dawson Academy, they had webinars every day at 8 a.m. And I don't think I missed one. And Maybe. then also the, the night ones. And I'm like, this is an opportunity to get all those, um, review these techniques. So when we come back, we, we do that. And at that time, um, John and I, well, it was, we were Instagram bodies. That's how we connected. Well, I kept sending him little messages here and there and talking about the webinars and excited about uh, continuing to learn. And that's how we connected via Instagram. Even though I have done the Dawson Academy curriculum, I had not had John as one of my instructors personally. I, I knew of him, but we hadn't. At just the lectures, it. right? Just just in the lectures, right? Yeah, yeah just on the uh, on the webinars. Yeah, before then, I only met you when we, I graduated. So did the, you do? So you did seminar one online? I did. Oh, okay. That's why. Okay. I did. Yeah, yeah. At that time, I had had my daughter was a, I think she was a month old when I did it online. So that's why I I did it. And um, so during that time, we connected and um, I wanted a mentor and because I haven't been learning all this stuff. I'm by myself practicing on my own. Uh, didn't have any real any other colleagues close by that were practicing the same philosophy and looking up to John, like this is a person I want to learn from. He has you know, great aesthetic skills, plus understands function has been a teacher and uh, for a long time so I like what a better person to learn from and at that time during that time John had mentioned that he was stepping down from Dawson, the Dawson Academy and I tell him this story every time but I was so crushed because I'm like well I finally found a mentor and he's stepping away so what am I going to do and uh, Shortly after, John uh, mentioned about the digital dentistry and what he, uh, with the protocols he has been doing with digital dentistry and thinking about starting to teach it. And he asked me if I would be interested. And for me, there was no question about it. I mean, I have been wanting to do digital, but like, well, whatever way I can get keep learning from John. I, I don't care if it's digital or analog, but it's a, uh, it was a bonus that it was, I have been wanting to learn the digital aspects of mounting on an articulator, doing the acoustical and, analysis. And, 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 you, and, 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 you, and one of the things that was intriguing that I heard from a lot of the people was you're kind of also at that point. And I remember going through this analog where you were doing the mountings and you're doing the photographs, but yes. you weren't really confident that what you were looking at was right. And exactly. so it was very difficult. And if you think about that, if she's in Iowa and I'm in Virginia, very difficult in the analog world for me to be able to look at her articulator. I mean, I'd have right. to be physically with her. So mm -hmm. in the digital world, she could mount on a virtual instrument inside a three shape, which way we do it. And I can look at things and check things and evolve. One of the things I want to tell you about her, Kirk, and you'll get a kick out of this. So when I created this protocol that for the coaching, I, I created probably about 23 hours of videos with sample cases. So they would have the cases that I'm working on and watch the video and they could follow along. So she got the software and she got the software. And I think the video is dropped on like a Friday morning or something like that. And I'm thinking that the videos are going to take people six months, eight months, and I was going to be adding to it, but I'd be way ahead of them. 
So she gets the videos on a Friday night and on Sunday night, I get a text from her and she goes, okay, I'm done with the videos. What's next? So she wow. like binges them. So I'm like, there's no freaking way. So I go to the thing and can see the progress and sure enough, it's a hundred percent, hundred percent. You know, she's done all the videos and I'm now freaking out. Like people are going <laughs> to be like, I'm going to have to like be up for days making more videos. Well, I, I didn't realize yet. No, Amy was a little bit of a freak. Um, but, but what, but what it was with Mrs. What was interesting. And this is what I learned from her and not everybody's the same. But Noemi was looking at this as a vehicle to be coached on clinical things. Like she wanted to get, she wanted to learn the botanology, but she did fast. Not everybody can learn it that fast, but she wanted to be able to talk about cases. And that's been the thing that's been so fun for me is that one-on-one -on -one coaching is so granular because I can be there with her and for, with her, it's a lot of, yes, that's right. Yep. Yep, that's right. Or I might say, how about, you know, a little bit, little tweaks here and there, but by and large, what she was doing was right. She just needed some affirmation and, and maybe some clarification of why. Um, but, you know, now she's doing full mouth cases and, you know, and it's just, it's unbelievable as a teacher, like you don't always, if you're lecturing in front of big crowds, you don't really know what people are doing. And in a coaching environment, you really do. Yeah. Um, so you're, you're right there with them, which I think is really, really cool. Okay. So let's get super specific. Cause I want to ask both of you this, you've used three words interchangeably mm -hmm. mentorship, you know, mentor coaches and teachers. Now they're all important. So if I'm younger or if I'm new to this game, how are they different? You yeah, know, I, I, I think it is different. I, I think there's, I think a, a mentor is often somebody that maybe is in your community, somebody that is, um, you know, that you're close with, it might be a periodontist, it might be an older dentist that you spend a little time with. But I think it's a little less formal. It's a right. little more, um, you know, it's a little less um, maybe organized, where I think as a coach, you know, it's a little bit more of a professional relationship. There's usually, you know, a a curriculum. There's usually something involved with very specific that you're doing. And I think as a teacher, a teacher is usually often not so much in a one-on-one -on -one setting. Like you might be in a classroom with 20 or 25 people. I think mentorship and coaching often is one-on-one, -on -one, but I think, uh, you know, the coach is usually something that you're committing some time and finances to that you're going to lock in. That's certainly how it was with my coach with Jerry. You know, I mean, I was committing to certain things and time that he would uh, assign to me. Whereas I think with a mentor, it's often somebody that you might have dinner with occasionally or swing by the office and it's a little looser. That's the way I think about it anyway. No, Amy, how would you characterize those three? I I agree. And I think with mentorship is, is less, maybe less official, someone that you might uh, communicate once in a while and ask questions and then uh, but it's not a structure as coaching and I with coaching what has been um, was great for me and from the beginning it's like I would schedule that time and I knew that and many times I'm like okay I need to get this case ready for that time so it kept me accountable in terms of like getting my stuff ready before I met with John because we had that time set up. We, and I, um, and, yeah. and you just said something that I think is a really good point is I think it's, there's also a difference from the standpoint of the person on the other side of it. So from the student perspective, there's one thing, but, but if you're a, if you're a mentor, yeah, I'll mentor you. And that means, you know, I'll give you some time when I'm free and our schedules connect. When you coach, you are committing time. So like with my Calendly calendar, I, I have about 10 hours a week that my clients can sign up for and I'm there for 45 minutes locked into whatever they're doing. Yeah. Um, and, yeah. I, and I think that's, I think that's the biggest difference is that I think there's a bigger level of commitment on the coaching side versus the mentor side or the. Right. And yeah, I'll be and honest. No, for, yeah. Sorry. No, you go, go you go. Alan. But I was going to say for me, when John, before starting the coaching, I didn't want to bother as much. I mean, or 
I don't want to say bother, but take his time without having a structure because I'm like, well, I, I don't know how much is too much, you know, in terms of uh, taking That's the true. other person's time. When um, when you set, set up like a coaching and if you are compensating the other person, then you feel like, okay, this is my time with this person and I, I don't feel uh, uh, bad or that I'm bothering. Yeah. Yeah. That for me felt better. <laughs> okay. So yeah. I want to ask you, so most people in dentistry, if you've been doing this long enough, you've heard of mentors, you know, study clubs, mm -hmm. and you've had teachers, you went to technical courses. And if you heard of a coach, it was usually a business coach, not a clinical coach. So Noemi, let's start with you. Like clinical coach, like what does that mean and how important is it to the development of a restorative dentist? For me, I'll, I'll give my example is that I would have cases that we're going through in the clinic, you know, in just real life cases that we would solve together the problem. We would uh, treatment plan together or, or I would treatment plan and ask John questions. And, but we are doing real life clinical cases versus going to a lecture and learning in general. But here uh, with a clinical coach is more specific to what I'm seeing in my practice. Uh, as a business, for a business coach, I did have one for a short period of time. That was more management of the practice or HR or more general things in the office, not so much specific clinical aspects of my patients. Yeah, and, and again, what Naomi, when I, when Amy was so, you know, and I guess with everybody that I'm work with, there's there is a lot of clarification when you kind of are moving from single tooth dentistry, going to bigger things. You're now change forever changing where the teeth are in space, and so you're looking at photographs, you're looking at models, you're looking at vertical, you're looking at all these things. And so the first step is, is getting comfortable visualizing, like, am I visualizing this right? Like, is this right. a good incised ledge? Is this mm -hmm. going to work? Is this occlusion? Is this what you mean by lines in front, dots and back? It, you know, what about envelope of function? We have a chance to clarify all those things. And once we do that, then you have to figure out how are we going to sequence this thing? Like, okay, I got to get these teeth out and now implants need to go in. Like, how am I going to sequence all those things? And when you're talking to somebody that's done it for 34 years, you know, it's kind of like all those years ago when I was talking to Pete, it was the same. I mean, he had so much experience that he knew instantly. I thought he was like the smartest person on the planet and he may have very well been, but it's also because he had so much clinical experience. He knew what would work, what and he knew the literature and all those things. So, so again, it's, I love it because I, on a lot of these meetings, I'm not really preparing for anything unless they tell me they want me to prepare for something. But most of the time, we're just talking about their cases and what they're doing and what's coming. And we look at Invisalign and we look, you know, we look at restorative things. And but all these things go back to fundamental principles of occlusion and aesthetics that sadly we don't get a whole lot of in dental school. You know, we get yeah. a little bit of it, but we're not really prepared to do those kind of cases. And so for doctors that want to do those kind of cases, I think this is a, this is a, an avenue that, you know, for really the price of a hands-on course at one of the big mm -hmm. continuums, you can have access to somebody for a full year. And that's a pretty good thing. Yeah, it's great. And so you don't really understand this when you're younger, but you get exposed to this information. And when you're young, you're like, I got it. I just heard it all. And then you go back and you're like, Oh my gosh, you go back to this busy practice, but exposure and proficiency and mastery, that's quite the journey. And so I want you guys to talk about this. As a restorative dentist, your hands can only go so far, but there's no limitations to what your brain can do. And that's really a lot of the failures that we experience in dentistry. John, you help me with this. It's really in the planning stage yeah. and the thinking. I want, can you speak to that, Noemi? And then John, I want you to speak to that too. Yeah, you know, I, to be honest, I think I had the knowledge how to do these cases, but trusting that, like John said, I, we're changing the occlusion of a 
patients. We're doing when we're doing bigger cases. I didn't want. I wanted to make sure that before I did it, I had someone with experience looking over it and just saying, "Yeah, we're in the right right place." Because you don't want to do any harm to the patient or put them in a in a worse position than they they come come in and. John, I you know I always laugh because he would look at my case in five minutes and tell me, and I'm like, okay, you just looked at it and you just give me the answers and it just makes the total sense. And I'm like, and I would always feel better after talking to him about the case. I'm like, okay, I got this. I feel better. It just gave me the confidence that I, to be honest, I never did a full mouth reconstruction until I had John as a coach. And part of the reason why I spent all that weekend watching the videos is because I had like 10 cases that I was waiting for to get into digital to be able to actually treat them. So I had been telling the patients, well, just wait, you know, we'll start in the new year. So I wanted to go through the videos, understand how to do it digitally, and then meet with John and get these, these cases going. So for a while, we met every Friday, I mean, like every week until uh, like for at least the first two months. Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, you only get one hour, but he was available some Friday, so. Yeah. One so hour you had, month. But so you, you had all these patients. I, I tell, and, and that's usually how it is. Like when somebody joins, I tell them, don't, if there's an open time, grab it. Because what always happens is if there were busy in the first four, five, six, seven weeks, like getting going, and then it starts to taper off and they jump on for different things. Um, you know, it's interesting too, is like younger docs, I find I'm in the coaching, you know, they don't struggle at all with the digital or the technology, but they need to learn about teeth and the older people, they know teeth, but I got to help them with the buttons. They just don't get the software. So I've got to spend a lot of time coaching them on the software. And that's kind of where we are right now, a little bit. Yeah. What do most people get wrong in this? You get a chance to watch dentists grow and develop. And I want to hear from both of you. Yeah, I think I think the biggest thing, um, I don't necessarily think it's wrong um, because everybody's a little bit different, but you usually will find out pretty quickly where their holes are. And that's one of the things that's so interesting to me is that Got a lot of people that have been through either Dawson or Panky or, you know, these curriculums. And I understand the philosophies because I can, and I can coach accordingly. Um, but it's interesting that, that a lot of times people will go through things and, and just miss a concept like envelope of function or something along those lines and are just not thinking about it. And, and, you know, sometimes we'll have a clarification, like a, just a clarification discussion of what sometimes something like that means. And you'll see them go to a higher level of understanding, just being able to talk through it, but not seeing that in their design of like a diagnostic wax up. If you miss something like that, it's catastrophic in the permanent restorations, like you can't miss that. So, so I think having these little checkpoints of being able to go through things is, is, is really, really important, but I will say generally, you know, beyond like what they're missing, the biggest thing with all these, with all of these docs is just confidence. I mean, just, just maybe having that little inkling but I think like, what if this isn't right? Like, what if I'm missing something? And I totally remember being there. Like, I totally remember being there. And, you know, when I was having those quarterly meetings uh, all those years ago, you know, I'd load up my little Toyota Tercel with, and I'd have articulators and models and poor Pete would see me coming and I'd have, you know, 10 models and bless his heart, he'd sit there and look at look at them with me and and do what I'm doing now, you know, do for me what I'm doing now, which is really, really cool. Yeah. And Noemi, tell me your thoughts on that. Like where do, where do most dentists go wrong or, or where are the holes in this process? As you look at what, you know, you look back at the last couple of years, where, where do you think most go wrong? In terms of like when prior to finding coaching or. In terms yeah. Of, I would say, you know, we, uh, dentists that I'm around or some colleagues that I know, we are 
they're in the same boat trying to do good dentistry and trying to, they're taking the continuing education and, and trying to do the best they can. I feel that uh, sometimes it can get, if you're taking multi, a lot of different type of courses and trying to implement all at once, it could get confusing without having one specific path or philosophy. And uh, so when I, what I notice, it, you know, that's one thing that it just can, it's hard to implement it. So my advice would be to find one of those philosophies, you know, there's could be Panky, Dawson, Poise, Spear, it, just focus on that. And then from there, branch out and start and learn the how to do the techniques. But then um, also, I mean, it's, for me, like I can speak, like finding a mentor or a coach, it's ideal. And I, I unfortunately, I don't think uh, everyone has a chance to, or an opportunity to have one. And that, in that case, it can limit how quickly you can progress or implement those, uh, all that you're learning into your practice and, and be able to do those bigger cases or more complex cases that you're wanting to do. Yeah, go back to that. I want you to go back. Cause I do hear that one almost every week. I'll hear a younger dentist or it's hard to find, I can't find a mentor. You know, like, I don't know what to do. I, I've been looking. I can't find a mentor. What do you, what would you say to them? What I would say is that uh, when you're going or whatever you're learning from, whatever uh, institution or different courses, and if you continue to see the uh, many of the professors or, or, or teachers that are providing the knowledge, just approach them. And for me, it's, uh, I'm lucky to have John in terms of like, what I look for, what I look for in, in a mentor was someone that was approachable, that I still look up to, you know, someone that I respected and maybe a little scary at first, but <laughs> now we're past that. But mm -hmm. so I wanted someone that I admire, you know, mm -hmm. and that I like, that's the type of dentistry I want to do. But then that person also has to be approachable and that you don't feel that I you cannot even ask them a question or or when they answer you you don't feel bad about their response you know what I mean right. that is it's a good communication and you still you feel like you're growing with that person as you get more comfortable you're like okay I, I I'm more I'm more comfortable with my dentistry and I'm also feel like I'm more comfortable with the mentor and that relationship continues to grow so I would just say in order to do that, I, I, it's at first it's not as easy as just like, I'm going to pick up this, pick this person. You just kind of have to develop that relationship somehow. But uh, many um, teachers or instructors that uh, are given courses out there are willing to teach and take students on their, their arms to to help them grow and um, but you have to kind of find that person that fits your personality as well I would say yeah I, I'm going to add to that too and, and I and I, I didn't even really realize this when when Pete invited me into that thing and, and he sort of took me under his wings but I also think that where I got really lucky with Pete in is that he not only had the clinical things that I wanted but we had a very similar value system. Like for him, doing great dentistry was 100% about being more predictive so that he could leave his office at five o'clock and go be a dad and, a, a, you know, like his, his values for family and faith. And like, he just, he was somebody I wanted to be like, right. not just as a dentist, but as a person. And so I think when you're picking a coach or a mentor, you can sack, you can separate it out. There, there are short-term relationships you can have. Like if you want to do better endo, you can probably find an endodontist that you're going to spend a little time with and you don't need that. But if you're, if you are looking for somebody to shape your practice, and I feel like that's what we're doing is it's not just about the dentistry, but we're really shaping how they practice and how they set their hours and how they manage their, their time. 
um, those are all hugely tied to your value system and who you are. And so um, I think the pe- what's really been fun is the people that we've naturally attracted. Like we all got to meet at the at Whit- the Whitmix Symposium, uh, the digital symposium. Most most everybody came, and we got to sort of really meet as a as a tribe for the first time, not just online. Uh, it was amazing how similar the group was. And, and I like to think it's because they were sort of attracted to what, what I like, you know, what I, how I vision, visualize my life and how I want to live things and, and utilize dentistry to be able to have this incredible life outside of the walls with my family and everything else. I'm so glad you said that because that's truly what this journey was all about. Even with Pete, with you, you know, I, I have workbooks of everything Pete ever said. I can probably remember three of them. I never, I don't really remember what he said, but I remember who he was mm-hmm. that touched my heart. You know what I mean? I, I'll just, I'll never forget. I got off the one lecture I did at the AARD. I was so nervous and he just, gave, he was the first person to hug me and I was like shaking and I was sweating and he's like, good job. Really good job. I was like, thank you. And so it's always good to get this. Now I want to, I want to wrap this up with a quote. And then I want you both to comment on it because John, I know a little bit about what you're up to, but this is one of my favorite things that I've learned in the last two years. I had someone say to me, Kirk, you're not really a leader till you develop other leaders that develop other, other leaders. So Noemi, no pressure, but say what that means to you, John and Noemi, I want you to say what that means to you also. Yeah. Are there any question about, it? I mean, I, you know, one of the things that, um, when you start getting a little bit along in years, you know, you start thinking about what has your, your life in, in, in dentistry and your life in, in what you practice, what does it sort of meant? And it, it is directly tied to the people that you touch. And so, you know, I, Pete called it the ripple effect, you know, as you, a, a drop of water hits a, a, a calm lake, how that ripple just goes across all the way. And that's and that's where I'm, we're at right now. And and that, and again, what's exciting about what's happening with our organization is now we've got three or four people that have clearly developed enough skill, both as a clinician, a dentist, and as uh, their expertise digitally, that they're going to start having some mentors uh, or taking some mentees on. Noemi's one of those people. It's going to be taking some people with them and. And what I love about that is there's going to be people that are naturally attracted to her to work with her and look up to her and, and be touched by her that would, wouldn't really fit with me. And, and that's okay. Right. And it's totally okay. So, um, so I'm, I, I, it, I've done a lot of things I'm proud of what's happening right now might be the most, most important thing that I, I look at. And, and it's because of what you just said in that quote. Yeah. Noemi, tell us your thoughts. Yeah, in my case, you know, I'm I'm more starting in my career and my goal is that, you know, I continue to be able to lead other dentists in terms of sharing what I have learned and from this experience of learning from a coach and then being able to coach as well. And But I can speak uh, um, more about my practice as a leader with my team and uh, also give, giving them the opportunity to learn from me and also ta- have the independence of them taking um, pride of being able to do certain things themselves within the office and be uh, the digital portion of it has been a huge part of it that they have learned uh, some of these techniques that how we're doing things now and then they take ownership and do it themselves. So I have, uh, you know, that that gives me some pride that they are also uh, embracing that portion. And as I look forward um, in the future, I, I would love to help other dentists benefit from what I have benefited uh, during this process. I feel like in a short period of time, I have gain the confidence to, you know, when I look back to years ago where I was at and where I'm now. So being able to share that um, knowledge and opportunity to for them to do the same in their practice. And as I continue in my career, being able to help 
and lead others uh, through the yeah, same. Yeah, and, and all the stuff, it's not just the digital, but all this, your accreditation process at the ACD. I mean, there's a lot of things you've got going on right now that are mm -hmm. where you're developing cells yourself, all the while raising two little kids and staying fit and all that stuff, you know. So your story to me is also can be unbelievably helpful. You are really like you don't have any idea how good you are at managing time because uh, you still manage to have a lot of blue time, fun time, too. So um, <laughs> John gives me a, a hard time. He says I'm a smart. I'm yeah, a I told smart. her she's got, you know, Pete used to call downtime like vacation <laughs> time, blue time. You remember that? I, I still use her, that. Yeah. Yeah. I told her that she had so much blue time during the first quarter, she was going to turn into a smurf. That's what I told her. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Yeah. Uh, I love that it. means it's a healthy practice, right? It takes That's time. awesome. I love this topic. I love what you guys are up to. Let's put some finishing touches on this. What, give us your final thoughts on, you know, getting a clinical coach, a mentor, a teacher. What are your final thoughts? Yeah, I just, I, I think that, you know, I think for doctors that are used to being taught things that are going to CE and, and accustomed to having a teacher, definitely look for a mentor and maybe even a, a coach. Um, I, you know, one of the things that uh, Noemi mentioned, the word that I really like was accountability. And when you're being taught by a teacher, there's zero accountability. When you have a coach that you've signed up time for and you're going to go online one on one, that coach knows instantly whether you've done the work or not. And I've been on the side of people seeing people that are prepared and and the ones that aren't prepared are embarrassed and apologizing and because they're wasting their time and they're wasting my time, you know, so I'm nice about it. But, you know, if it's happening a lot, you got to go. We got to help you. How can we help you organize your time so that we can get more out of this. And so there's lessons in that too. But I think that, you know, it, it may not be a hundred percent for everybody, but I think understanding the teaching, coaching, mentor spectrum, think about who you are. And if you're somebody that can benefit from that, uh, you know, go ahead and go ahead and, and, and start working in that direction. Love it. Noemi, what are your final thoughts? Yeah. For me, I would say, I mean, it's, um, it's a no-brainer in terms of how quickly you can get to where you want to be if you find that right mentor. And uh, you can take, I, mean, I have taken countless hours of continuing education, but implementing it, I have to say, it was since I started, when I tell this to other colleagues, since I started having John as my mentor, it just completely changed the way I practice. And maybe that's why I can take so much blue time, John. <laughs> um, Love it. Thank you. <laughs> but yes, and and like I said earlier, is just finding that right person that fits you, and uh, and knowing what how you want to practice, and observing who can be, who do I look up to, and uh, who do I want to learn more from because I want to practice that way. So that's key because find, I would say if you don't have that clear vision, just getting anyone it might not be as helpful because you might not have the same vision or you might not have that connection that you feel comfortable talking to each other and learning from. So you have to have that uh, vision of who is that person you want to learn from and then from there grow. So well said. Connecting. Yeah, I appreciate this so much from both of you. Now, if I'm listening, John, you know, where do I go? Like yeah, so there's there's two two resources I can give you. If you want to just see what we do at, at Cranham Culp at our digital training, uh, it's uh, ccdigitaldental.com, ccdigitaldental.com. Um, if you want to have a discussion with me, you can just email me at jcranham, C-R-A-N-H-A-M, jcranham at mac, M-A-C dot com. Um, and we can, if, if you want to have a discussion, if you email me and tell me that I can send you a link to my Calendly site, which is sort of my little coaching thing. And you can grab a spot. We can have a 30, 30, 40 minute discussion and talk about your goals. And, you know, you might listen to this and want to work with Noemi. I can certainly set that up, but I do think it's a, um, it's certainly for certain people that again, 
docs that are a little more comprehensively minded that want to go digital and want to have that next level of coaching. Um, we've had certainly a lot of fun developing this community. Awesome. Awesome. Why, well, you know, sorry, I was just going to say people have questions for me in terms of my experience going through the coaching. I'll be happy to, to answer questions as well. So, um, and I did, um, so for my Instagram is Noemi Cruz Orca DDS, so that they can send me a message. Through yeah. Instagram? So, Through Instagram is fine. Yes. Oh, okay. So we're going to put, uh, if it's okay, we're going to put your Instagram handle on yeah. in the show notes. So uh, if you're listening to this, you want these, both of these individuals, amazing human beings. So you can flip up to the notes, Stitcher, iTunes, Spotify, whatever. You'll see the information that was discussed during the podcast. You can click right on it. It'll take you directly to it. If you're not taking notes, don't worry. We're taking them for you. So uh, you guys can get the most out of these podcasts. So thank you both for being on. I really appreciate both of you. Thank you. Thanks for having us, Kurt. I appreciate it. Oh my gosh, it's so much fun. Stick around while I say goodbye to everybody else, but thank you guys for listening. I love this. I don't even know where it's going. I don't even care. It's so much fun. I get to hang out and learn from the best and you can do the same. So uh, keep sending us suggestions for things that you guys want to see. We're lining them up. And until we hear from you next time, or you see us next time, keep watching or keep listening to the best practices show. You guys enjoy your day.